my prayer this year is that this pulpit is used to truly do what God has ordained it to do. Um, and there is something that I sense or that we sense by the Holy Spirit. Um, this is not a year to play church. Um, and why I say that is, that is that traditions are not actually transformational unless they actually have a Holy Spirit breath in it. And um, I really sense God saying, you know, and I really, today, I just invite him to use this year that we would have the boldness to preach the gospel in an undiluted way. That we would put, we would put the word in front of people and that it would, be, it would not be the opinions of men, but the wisdom of God. And as we begin the new year, I wanna encourage you in the fact that we are entering new but how many of you have truly paused to actually say, Lord, what would you have me do this year? What are you saying to me this year? I'm not talking to what are your needs, okay? You've all woken up to January and inflation and all the things that come with the new year and all the challenges that come with the new year. I'm not specifically speaking to needs. I'm talking higher than needs, which is purpose and calling. You're not just alive to pay your debt, okay? You're not just alive to get a degree. You're not just alive to work a certain amount of years and accumulate a certain amount of money and have a certain amount of children biologically and then die. No, you have a purpose. And that, that is a divine assignment. It is not a purpose that is determined by the world, it is a purpose that was declared and preordained by God himself when he made you in your mother's womb. And so I wanna encourage you to tap into that because you need to hear from he who made you what he has called for you this year. There are so many voices speaking into your situation right now. Everything from what the world is saying to what your needs are and what your emotions are saying. But please begin the year allowing those things to be silenced and allowing God to speak, right? Because he has a plan and a purpose to prosper you. He's already preordained a path for you this year. He's already seen not just a way through, but a way for him to use you and for you to be promoted and elevated in more ways than just financial and at work, but you to actually gain authority, to gain victory, to see your life mature into the powerful believer that God preordained over your life. So at the beginning of this year, please set aside time for God to speak to you. I, I believe we have a word for the year, this year that we'll be sharing over our church in the coming weeks. It always flows together. But I just really wanna, I really wanna ask you, in fact, implore you, child of God, don't begin the year without God speaking. Write it down. Let it be the foundation that you see the year from. And so today I'm speaking to you from the subject new beginnings. And the Bible is very, very clear about new beginnings. It has a lot to say about new beginnings. But what's fascinating about new beginnings is the Bible throws some changes into the circumstance, the situation, and the word over new beginnings that is different to the way we perceive it by the flesh. In other words, when we look at a new beginning, we have certain prerequisites. We have certain predeterminations. We have certain conditions that would make something a new beginning. So in the natural world right now, we have December 31st, we go over into January 1st and we celebrate a new year. That is a calendar driven thing. And then with comes New Year's comes this whole conversation, a new you. <coughs> a, a change, new circumstances. Oh, this year I'm going to do all these things. But what's interesting is where the Bible begins with New Year's is far better than when we begin with New Year's. And it's far more miraculous. The first time new beginnings is mentioned around the calendar is in Exodus chapter 10. Sorry, Exodus chapter 12. Exodus chapter 12, verses one. Now the Lord spoke to Moses and Aaron in the land of Egypt. So the context of God speaking is what? The children of God are in slavery. 
under a pharaoh. He is making all the decisions for them. They have no rights. They have no freedoms. They have no authority. They are slaves. So God is speaking, and we've already had all of these so-called signs to Pharaoh. And one verse earlier, God actually says, Pharaoh is not going to listen to you. He hasn't listened. And so now he comes, God, and he says, this month, verse 2, shall be the beginning of your months, and it shall be the first month of the year to you. So God says, this is going to be the first to you. Who is he speaking to? The Egyptians? No. He's speaking to the nation of Israel. And God says, I declare your circumstances haven't changed and Pharaoh won't listen, but now I determine this will be a new, if you read the Hebrew, beginning. Now, Jewish people celebrate Rosh Hashanah, the new beginning, usually around September. But actually, that is not the time New Beginnings was first installed according to the Word of God. The first New Beginning was here. Right? And this takes place actually at the time and the setting of Passover. All right? Now, we usually celebrate that around Easter. It's the same season around Passover. But how many of you know, none of us, not even us, nor actually modern day Israel, call Easter the new year. But what God called new beginnings was in the middle of slavery, where nothing had changed, where everything appeared to be against them, where they were in bondage, under Pharaoh. How many of you have already given up on new beginnings this year because your circumstances haven't got better, they got worse. And we say new beginnings come when new opportunities arise. And the word of God says new beginnings come when the Passover lamb dies. Can I sit on that for a moment? You can make anything new at any time without a calendar, without a New Year's celebration, without a new spouse, without a new president, without a new job, in the midst of destruction, slavery, desperation and depression, you can invite it to be a time of new beginning. In the middle of oppression and depression and slavery and bondage, and financial ruin, you can say it's a new beginning, scripturally. How do we know it's a new beginning? Because God is about to do something about the entire setting of the nation of Israel. What happens as we keep reading? God says, it's a new beginning. Speak to all the congregation of Israel saying, on the 10th of this month, every man shall take for himself a lamb. According to the house of his father, a lamb for a household. And if the household is too small for the lamb, let him take his neighbor next to his house and take it according to the number of the persons, according to each man's need. You shall take your count for the lamb. And your lamb shall be without blemish. A male of the first year. God says, in a new beginning, each house takes its lamb. The firstborn male, without blemish, as you have need. It's interesting because the Bible uses the word congregation. Tell the congregation. It's so important for us to recognize that the word we sit under as a congregation says, yes, you have a need, but you also have a lamb. See, the gospel of Jesus Christ is the only thing that redeems the deepest, darkest 
situation. It's the only word that brings faith into a moment. It's the only revelation that deals not just with you, but with your circumstance. Not just with you, but your enemies. Not just with you, but with everything. And what is essential is that the pulpit continuously points the congregation to the gospel of Jesus Christ. In fact, pastoring is pointing you to Jesus. If it's not pointing you to Jesus, and if it's not standing in consistency with the word of God, it is not pastoring you, it's perverting you. It's not leading you into freedom, it's setting you into bondage. So sitting under a word that points you to the lamb is the most important thing for a new beginning. So tomorrow, if you say, well, it doesn't feel like a new beginning, what should you do? You should listen to the word that points you to the work of Jesus. And you receive that into your household as you have need. It goes on then to say, now you shall take it and keep it until the 14th day of the same month, meaning five days later from you receiving the lamb into your house, you should do this. The whole assembly in the congregation of Israel shall kill it at twilight. And they shall take some of the blood and put it on the two doorposts and on the lintel of the house where they eat it. Then they shall eat the flesh that night and roast it with fire, with unleavened bread and bitter herbs they shall eat it. Don't eat it raw nor boil it with water, but roast it in fire with its head and its legs and its entrails. You shall let none of it remain until morning. And what remains of it until morning you shall burn with fire, and thus you shall eat it with the belt on your waist, sandals on your feet, and your staff in your hand, so shall you eat it in haste. It is the Lord's Passover. For I will pass through the land of Egypt on that night, and I will strike all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, both men and beast. And against all the gods of Egypt, I will execute judgment. I am the Lord. Now the blood shall be a sign for you on the house where you are. And when I see the blood, I will pass over you and the plague shall not be on you to destroy you when I strike the land of Egypt. So this day shall be to you a memorial and you shall keep it as a feast to the Lord throughout your generations. You shall keep it as a feast by an everlasting ordinance. Irrespective of whether I'm pacing the floor or in bed asleep, the angel of death passes by not because of the depth of my faith, nor the strength of my fortitude, nor the length of my prayers, nor the desperation of my fasting, that angel passes by based on the blood and the qualification of the lamb that was killed, the life that was taken already to give that household life, the innocence that was punished for being guilty to declare the household innocent. The favor that was taken from that lamb, the fire that was put on it, the judgment that was placed on it for the judgment on that household. See, they were not set free and released just like everybody else. The next day that they left, the Bible tells us they were healed of infirmities. Why? How can you say that? Because it says none of them were sick. Right? What do you mean? A nation of slaves for hundreds of years. No one is sick. No one has a sore knee. No one has bruised ribs. No one has a scar. No one has skin cancer from no sunscreen and being a slave in the Egyptian sun. No, they were healed. Not only were they healed of all disease and sickness, they left with all the gold and silver and gems that Egypt had because Pharaoh back paid them 400 years plus interest. They didn't just, I'm so glad the Bible didn't say they left with prosperity because we would have redefined it as, oh no, they were at peace, true prosperity. No, 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 the Bible says they left with all the gold and the silver. 
they were made rich. Right? The circumstances had nothing to do with the setup for them to have a new beginning. In fact, it was the very declaration that it was a divine new beginning. The fact that they were able to have everything turn in an instant for their good in the midst of slavery, oppression, and everything else that comes with it. You don't need a new year for a new beginning. You don't need a new job for a new beginning. You don't need a new spouse for a new beginning. You don't need a new skin color for a new beginning. You don't need a new currency, a new degree, a new declaration over your life for a new beginning. You need to put that lamb in your mess, in your situation, and declare that that lamb died, bore your sickness, bore your disease, bore every single designed attack of the enemy so that you could have freedom, so that you could live, so that you could thrive. The nation of Egypt lost every firstborn, its entire labor force, and all of its wealth in a day. Huh. It wasn't a circumstance of prosperity for all, but it was a circumstance of divine prosperity for those who had the lamb. And you don't need to go home tonight and pray big prayers and impress God. You can sit and tremor tomorrow in traffic going, I don't even know how it's going to make. I don't even know. But you know what? Tremor under the blood of the lamb. Okay? I, I, I'm not saying to you, don't rise in boldness. I am saying to you, it's okay sometimes when you see what's going on around you and it scares you. When you see your inferiority in comparison to what you need to do and be overwhelmed with the reality, I can't do this. In fact, I would argue this year, we should take every area of our life and ask, am I doing this alone? Or am I doing this with the Lord? How do you know if you're doing it with the Lord? Well, have you taken it to him and said, what would you have me do with this? What would you say over this? What would you ask of this? I truly believe that if you don't do that, you are actually doing it in your own strength. If you're not prepared, now I'm not, listen, I'm preaching to me today, okay? This is for me, all right? But this year, God wants to promote us. But true promotion comes on the other side of humility. Humility is saying, I can't, but you can. Humility, as we've heard in this church, is not God's hand over you, but God's hand extended down towards you because you're already down in your mess, in your own strength. And you reach up and you grab on, and that is called humility. What is the opposite of humility is the word? Sorry? What? Say it again. The world is declaring its agenda in your face. The devil is making us celebrate his way as the way. I'm not just talking about a flag or a people. I'm talking about a spirit on the earth that says, I'm gonna do this my way. And even in the church, we often go, I don't need the Lord. I'm better than that person. I don't have that sin. In fact, when we're speaking about people struggling with sexual identity, we should have compassion and love and recognize what they are facing and recognize what they're challenged with. But can I just say this? We've also got to recognize there is only one way God works through us. And that is when we say, I can't do this my way. I need you to help me do this your way, Lord. But at the same time, the posture of the church cannot be one that says, I've got this all together because that's pride too, right? Pride. When humans say, not your way, but my way. I don't have pride, pastor. I'm, are you married? Yes, okay, I guarantee you, you do. Because how many times does the Lord say to you, do this towards your spouse? 
Walk in forgiveness, walk in repentance, walk in humility. You're like, not today. (coughs) They do not deserve my repentance. When God asks us to do something, our response should be yes. But we don't even involve him in areas in our lives. Some of you already think you've got your finances sorted for the year. I'm good. I've got a big business pastor. I'm rolling around in Louis Vuitton, Gucci. I'm part of that crew. My hustle's all over Instagram. Everybody knows I've got four cars, 15 Lambos, and this. If you're doing it without God, it's dangerous. Right? I don't know, Pastor, I've got this all together. I know how to handle this. If you're doing it without God, it's dangerous. Why? Why? Because can I just tell you, you cannot avoid the destruction that sits out there. Because it is a spirit that's rampant in the world that is prophesied that the world will get darker, but the church can get brighter and will get brighter. Should the church allow the glory to go to God? Right? But pride manifests itself in the actions of control. I want to do this my way. Can I tell you something? I'm very happy to pastor this church on one condition. It's my way. I don't want to pastor this church God's way. Because God's way robs me of my control. Why do I want control? Because I want the credit. I'll throw myself on the altar of all of you today. And if I get the credit, then I get the glory, and we're not designed to get the glory. Pastors are not designed to be worshipped. Pastors are not designed to be, oh, if you you were to, oh, if, if, no, no, no. There's only one who gets the credit and the glory, and that's Jesus, right? But for him to get the credit and the glory, we are going to have to release control. Lord, not my way, but your way. People say, people say out there, I shouldn't love my brother or sister. I shouldn't serve my brother or sister. I shouldn't pray for my brother or sister. People say I should. Now it's now you can't pray. No, no, but the Lord says, do it my way. And when you do it my way, when there is destruction in the land, I come to change the narrative. Even if there's destruction on your street, how many of you know they were slaves into their very homes? Can I, oh man, I don't have time. The slavery didn't stop outside the house. Because your circumstance, I don't know about you, but my circumstances always wake their way into my home. What's going on in the world, we discuss at dinner. What our fears are, what our challenges are. I don't know about you, we want to create a utopic experience for our children where they don't know mom and dad are stressed or mom and dad are fighting or mom and dad are angry. But how many of you know the world makes its way into your home? They weren't just slaves in the land. They were slaves in their homes. Every action, every thought was held hostage to the fact that we are not free. We are not valuable. God is not with us. We are under someone else's rule. We are impoverished. We are robbed. We are tortured. We are slaughtered. That's why God sends the lamb into the home. To be cooked inside the house. To witness that that lamb bore the pain and the suffering in the midst of your circumstance, all the way to the inner core. My prayer this year is that the grace of God isn't something I know of, that the grace of God isn't something I study, but the grace of God is something I experience in the core, to the root, in the deepest parts of me that I hide from him, that I am proud for him, that I'm ashamed of, that I don't want people to know. Because when that happens, slavery doesn't just get dealt with on the outside. Slavery gets dealt with first on the inside, right? And when you are free on the inside, it's irrespective of what's going on on the outside, right? And for some of you, you might say, but pastor, you don't understand the mess I'm in. I have been broken and bound my whole life. You do not understand the depth of depravity that I face. I know this is a harsh year for the first word of the year. I'm so sorry. But it's really a good word because stay with me till the end. But you might be saying today, (coughs) fair enough that you say these things, but you don't understand. 
I feel this way. I only know this way. I've always been someone facing depression. I've always been someone who's a gambler. I've always been someone who's insecure. I've always been lustful. I've always been someone with, with deep, dark depravity. I've always had sin be a part of my identity right from my beginning, from my genesis. And what's fascinating is God knows. Now, I need to tell you this. God didn't make you that way. We do not see someone walking around with no limbs and a physical deformity and say, isn't it beautiful how God designed them that way? They are beautiful because God loves them and we love them, but we call it like something went wrong. And the devil wants you to identify with what's disformed in your life, with what's gone wrong in your life, with the wounds you bear, with the brokenness you have and say, that's you. It is you in the old Adam. But you need to recognize you have been born again. You were born one way, according to the sin of Adam, according to the fall of man, according to the issues in people, the fallen genetics, the fallen DNAs, all of the brokenness in this world. You might have been born into a home without parents, born an orphan, born, but you were born one way. Under a curse. The world is under a curse. But you have been born again. Born into blessing. Born into wholeness. In Numbers chapter 5, it's a very interesting passage I want to read to you. Verse 11, and it says here, (coughs) the things concerning Unfaithful wives. All right? Now, this is not just for wives, but I want to read it to you. This is the curses upon people who are in marriage that get into adultery. Says the Lord spoke to Moses saying, speak to the children and say to them, if any man's wife goes astray, behaves unfaithfully towards him, and a man lies carnally with her, and it is hidden from the eyes of her husband, it is concealed, that she has defiled herself, there shall be no witness against her, nor has she been caught, but the spirit of jealousy will come upon him. Basically it says, if she has been unfaithful, through the spirit of jealousy, the husband will bring the woman to the priest. Verse 16, the priest shall bring her near, set her before the Lord, the priest shall take holy water in an earthen vessel, everybody say holy water, and shall take some dust that is on the floor of the tabernacle and put it into the water, Then the priest shall stand with the woman before the Lord, uncover the woman's head, and put the offering for remembering in her hands, which is the grain offering of jealousy. And the priest shall have his hand, shall shall have in his hand the bitter water that brings a curse. And the priest shall put her under oath and say to the woman, if no man is laying with you and you have not gone astray to the uncleanliness while you were in your husband's authority, you'll be free from this bitter water that brings a curse. Curse. What does it bring? A curse. Bitter water. But if you have gone astray while you are under your husband's authority, and if you have defiled yourself, and some man other than your husband is laying with you, then the priest shall put the woman under this oath of the curse, and he shall say to the woman, The Lord make you a curse and an oath among your people. And when the Lord makes your thigh rot and your belly swell, may this water cause the curse to go into your stomach and make your belly swell and your thigh rot. Then the woman shall say, amen, so be it. If you cheat on your husband and he suspects it without evidence or witness, he brings you to the priest. And the priest says, I don't know, but God does. If you have done it, you will drink this bitter water and this bitter water in this cup will make you so sick that your belly will swell and your thighs will rot. That's not all. Verse 23, then the priest shall write these curses in a book and he shall scrape them off into the bitter water and he shall make the woman drink the bitter water that brings a curse and the water that brings a curse shall enter to become, shall, shall enter her to become bitter. Then the priest shall take the grain From the woman's hand shall wave the offering before the Lord and bring it to the altar. And the priest shall take a handful of the offering 
and its memorial portion, burn it on the altar, and afterward make the woman drink the water. So the water has got holy water, ground of the tabernacle, and the curse written on paper, put in the cup. That's what happens if you sin. That's what happens if you have betrayed God under the law. You might have a hectic past and an even more messed up future until you decide to bring Jesus into your present. And let me tell you how Jesus works. He's not even waiting for you to fall on the ground and cry out, save me. He's just looking for you to be in his presence. You know what? I want to encourage you, bring people to church this year. Let them be under the presence of the word of God. Even if they, don't be like, you need Jesus. Be like, hey, come for a free coffee. Come hang out. We just hear some good things for the year, some motivational speaking. Get them here and they'll hear about Jesus in a way where he will come to them. John chapter four, verses six. Now Jacob's well was there. Jesus, therefore being wearied from his journey, sat thus at the well. It was the sixth hour and a woman of Samaria came to draw water. Jesus said to her, give me a drink. For his disciples had gone away into the city to buy food. Then the woman of Samaria said to him, how is it that you being a Jew ask a drink from me, a Samaritan woman? For the Jews have no dealings with Samaritans. Jesus answered to her and said, if you knew the gift of God and who it is who says to you, give me a drink, you would have asked him and he would have given you living water. The woman said to him, sir, you have nothing to draw with. The well is deep. Where do you get this living water? Are you greater than our father Jacob who gave us the well and drank from it himself as well as all his sons and his lifestyle? And Jesus answered her and said, whoever drinks of this water will thirst again. But whoever drinks of the water that I shall give him will never thirst. But the water that I shall give him will become in him a fountain of water springing up into everlasting life. Then the woman said, sir, give me this water that I may not thirst, nor come here to draw. There are promises and there are provisions that Jesus declares over your life this year. That Jesus, by the Spirit of God, says, I'm going to use you where you are in the circumstance you're in to be used by me. And you know what we say? Yes, amen, hallelujah, this is my year, 2024. Some people are saying more in 2024, the best year yet. Give me those promises. And our high priest says, go call your husband and come here. The woman answers and says, I have no husband. And Jesus said to her, you've well said it. I have no husband. For you've had five husbands. And the one with whom you now have is not your husband. You've told the truth. She said, I perceive that you are a prophet. Our fathers worshiped him on this mountain. The Jews say that in Jerusalem there's a place we ought to worship. And, she said, and Jesus said to her, woman, believe me, the hour is coming when you'll neither worship on this mountain nor Jerusalem. Worship the Father, you will worship what you do not know. We know what we worship for salvation is of the Jews. But the hour is coming now and is now here when true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth. For the Father is seeking such to worship him. God is spirit and those who worship him must worship in spirit and truth. And she said, I know the Messiah or the one who was called Messiah, called Christ. When he comes, he will tell us all things. And she said, and he says, I who speak to you am he. Right? God, in his grace, has provision promises for you this year. Supernatural declarations. But to worship in spirit and in truth is for him to come into the part of you that is supposed to be cursed with bitter water. 
that if you were to bring that part of you under the old, you would be judged and cursed and declared unclean. Jesus was referring to the law's declaration of Numbers chapter five, where a woman who is in adultery is meant to drink a curse unto herself. And he says, now, if you drink of my water, if you will take what I give you, the high priest, if you will drink of what I prepare for you, a cup not with curse, but with deliverance, a cup not with curse, but with redemption, and you drink of the water I give you, you'll never thirst again, right? And the purpose of that curse on those women was that they would never reproduce a child again. If your thighs rot and your belly swells, you have been cursed in your reproductive area. And what is the very first thing that comes from her lips and her work and her efforts, we go on to verse 39. And many of the Samaritans of that city believed him because of the word of the woman who testified. He told me all that I ever did. She was able to reproduce children of the Most High God, to bring children into the family of God. She was able to save, deliver, and set free people. The moment she drank, she went back with the testimony. But the testimony was not, I've never been unfaithful, and the Messiah wants you to know, believe him. Her testimony was, everyone here, knows what should have happened to me if I went to the priest. I haven't been unfaithful on my first husband. I've been unfaithful on many husbands. And now I'm living with a man who isn't even my husband. It doesn't even say whether or not she's, her husband is dead. She says the man, the man I'm sleeping with is not my husband. We don't even know if she actually has a husband at the time, but she's living with another man. But her testimony is, <laughs> I was supposed to be cursed. I was supposed to drink water that would bring a curse on me, that would rob me of any fruit. But I met Jesus, the lamb. So John says, behold the lamb who came to take away all the sins of the world. Jesus not only lets her drink of water, but he drinks from our cup in the garden and says, I'll take your place and drink the curse that you deserved, that you've sinned and brought on yourself. I will drink that cup for you. I will take your place. This is a year of new beginnings. But new beginnings are not when I've got it together then I, when I get to a multimillionaire pastor, then I'll start trusting the Lord with my tithe. When I uh, have a better circumstance in my marriage, then I will love and serve and, and forgive and honor. And no, no, when they change, no, no, when, when the nation changes, no, no, when, when politics changes, no, when my environment changes, then I can believe for a new beginning. No, you need a new beginning because of where you are and because of what you face and because of how you feel and because of even the very sin you commit that under the law would declare you someone who should drink a curse. No, the new beginning is, I'm done doing it my way, but I have a lamb that I can bring into this house, into this situation and say, that lamb died for me so that I can drink of him. 
from him, from his cup of blessing, his cup of redemption. And I can see my life change from the inside out. I can see a new beginning, not because anything new is in the world, but because something is new in me. I don't care if you've been a believer for 30 years or 30 seconds. God wants to give you a new beginning in every area of your life this year. And he wants a new beginning to be based on Jesus, founded in his work. And when it is that, it will flourish, irrespective of the land, the pharaohs, the laws, the situations, the settings, the circumstances, the economies. None of that matters if the blood of the lamb is working for you if the body of the lamb was burnt for you. Faith is not how good am I. Faith is how good is he. Faith is not I've got this figured out. It's he's got this figured out. Faith is not I know what to do. Faith is he knows what to do. Faith is not my opinion says. Faith is his word says. But you know what I love about Jesus? The first convert in scripture He comes into that situation and he doesn't just redeem a woman who's cheated on her husband once. She is identified and known as a serial cheater. It's who she is, not the mistake she made. And he says, I've come here just for you. Just for you. We find that same act of Jesus in scripture when he goes far away to a place 40 miles away from where he is to find a man who has been possessed with a legion of demons. Jesus comes and walks 40 miles in the flesh to a person the village cannot deal with and they say he's demon possessed and when Jesus arrives, he says, who are you? It says, we are not one, we are many, right? Jesus doesn't run away, that's why he came. And the interesting thing there is the original Greek, the devil doesn't say, we are one, we are legion. The devil says, we have many identities. I don't know who I am. I don't know what I am. And Jesus says, I'll go 40 miles just for you to set you free. Every issue we face in society, Jesus is the answer. His grace is the answer. His blood being shed is the answer. Every circumstance you face, He is the answer. And I cannot wait to see and hear the testimonies in our lives as we bring Him into the middle of our mess and declare today is a new beginning. Today is a new beginning. Tomorrow is a new beginning. The next day is a new beginning. I make all things new. And he calls you a new creation. Can I pray with you before I let redemption go? God, let our lives declare it's a new beginning this year. Father, lead us and guide us. Let us allow you into every area of our life, not because you came to condemn us, but John 3, 16 and 17 says, for God so loved the world that he sent his son to die so that everyone who would believe would not perish but have everlasting life. Jesus did not come to condemn the world, but to save it. Jesus showed up to the woman at the well to bring her into her true identity as a child of God. Let Jesus lead us to live as children of God, sons and daughters, set up to thrive and shine in this world. In Jesus' name I pray, amen.